Hey guys, uh, thanks for coming out. My name is Johan and uh, this is Sebastian and uh, we're two of the guys who worked on this project. We, uh, we're gonna try to get into it as, as, as fast as possible. Uh, we work at a company called DDB, which is a big creative agency in Stockholm. Uh, it's part of a... I'm gonna leave it here, man. Yeah, yeah sure. No? <laughs> it's part of a, a global network uh, and also a Nordic network where uh, Stockholm is the main office. We're about 200 people and in, in the Nordics we're about 450 people and these are some of the clients we work with. Um, everything from Volkswagen to uh, McDonald's, obviously. And me and Seb Sebastian, we work on a team called Innovation and Prototyping, which is a smaller team uh, with four people that we started. Basically, when we started at uh, DDB for about one and a half years ago, and we focus mainly on creative technology, R&D, uh, digital product and business development. So we do things a bit differently than the rest of the agency. Uh, a huge part of, of DDB is, is traditional ads, and we don't really work with ads or campaigns at all. Uh, but obviously, what we do have to be a part of the, the campaign format as well. And Happy Goggles is an example of that, um, a, a product development project that ended up being uh, a campaign as well. Um, and here's some contact if you, info if you want to get in touch with us. Uh, we'll have that at the end as well. And uh, this is what we're going to be talking about today. So first, we go through the idea really quick. And then I'm going to start talking about how this project came to be and some of the early um, challenges we had. And then we'll go into a bit of solutions. And then Sebastian's going to come up and dig deeper into the tech parts and share a bit of um, what we usually do when we do uh, prototyping and then end with some uh, execution examples. And once again, if you have any questions, on my part, just raise your hand, uh, and then we'll take the longer format questions afterwards. But if it's something that's unclear or uh, that seems weird, so don't don't hesitate to ask. Um, and this is just to give you kind of a brief overview of, of the timings, because that makes all the difference. If it's a three-month project or, a, in this case, about 10, year, uh, 10, 10 years, 10 months project. Um, but it doesn't really do it. Uh, it felt like 10 years. It doesn't really do it justice, because it, in our business, it's not really a, a straight work. We do might do two re really intense weeks and then show something to the client and then wait for <coughs> feedback and jump on another project. So it, it, it started in about May, June in 2015, and we launched it in February, March in 2016. But all in all, it's probably like four or five really high intensity months of work. Um, and also, like this presentation, I'm going to start talking about the box uh, and that experience, because that was one of my main focuses. Um, and Sebastian's going to dig into the games and the parts around that. But it was all gone together. It wasn't like we did anything in sequence, which is going to be pretty clear. But this is just this is, this is going to be the last sequ nice sequential thing you're going to see for an hour now. And then it's going to be things smashed up together. Uh, and this is just a slide of, of uh, the whole team that worked on this project. And because even if me and Sebastian did a, a lot of work, a lot of people did a lot of work on this project. Um, it didn't just involve the box and the game. It involved uh, product landing sites, events in the restaurants, it did 3D videos, instructional illustrations, social media. It was uh, a lot of people involved. So we just want to make that clear before we go inside uh, the, the, the presentation and give you an idea of who was on here. Um, and we'll start with the idea, and I guess everyone knows what a Happy Meal box is, right? Uh, and we, we couldn't get the audio to work, but we we're going to play a brief um, case video here. So we're going to see, we're going to try to use the sound from the computer, actually, and see how well that works. Otherwise, I'm going to have to speak it. And for over 30 years, kids have loved their Happy Meal and its free toys. But today... Kids' play patterns and expectations are changing fast. The Happy Meal needs to move with the times. The meals are going high tech. Well, watch this animation here, quick clever. McDonald's locations in Sweden, the Happy Meal boxes will convert into low cost virtual reality headsets. Kids can unfold the iconic red box and fold it up to create the Happy Goggle. Happy Goggle. Happy Goggle. <laughs> <laughs> And it's one of the cooler things we've seen in a while. The 
plain old box didn't just become a VR headset, it also became headline news. Covered across the globe. Most case films always include results. Yeah, you get the idea. Oop. Sorry. <laughs> Did I? Yeah, robot. Was it the the second screen? There's so many screens up here. Oh. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, that's a feature. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> And we're back. Kind of. the screen. And we're back. Right. Uh, yay. Um, so this is a quote from Fast Company. And the reason we have it in this presentation is not only to brag about how we're in Fast Company, it's also to highlight one of the most uh, important thing for us in this project. And it's going to go through the whole project. It was about scale. I mean, for us, uh, the, the big motivator was early on to be able to hopefully give VR to about a billion kids, which is the amount of Happy Meals sold in the world each year. And we really wanted to make something that would make global McDonald's uh, get their eyes on this, because it's really hard to do global projects. And also, continuously, we were just talking about how awesome it would be if we would have gotten this type of Happy Meal when we were kids. So that's just like, that's the main motivation for us, at least, and the, the, the things that made us really want to push through. Um, and we get this comparison a lot, which isn't, isn't weird. We have one here as well. Um, and the project in the beginning actually was, the goal was to make a, a cardboard clone, or it was kind of the idea from the start. Uh, what we ended up doing was, it's very different from a cardboard, even though it kind of looks the same. And I'll go through that with how we actually did things. Uh, but of course, it was highly inspired by, by the cardboard, even though when we started prototyping and building our first things, a lot of the things that have come in the last year wasn't around. Um, and we'll start with uh, the initial challenges. Uh, this whole project wasn't really like a magical light bulb idea or something that came out of a creative session. It was more like something we usually do. We spend a lot of time with R&D. And we had a night of just uh, building low-fi VR headsets, because even if you're you do, you do tech, you will want to spend as much time doing lo-fi as you do hi-fi. And we were just goofing around, um, building some really weird things and, and some pretty useful things. And we kind of went on with our lives thinking, you know, you could probably do a, a simple VR viewer out of anything. And uh, we work right next to the McDonald's team. So they have a bunch of, head, a bunch of Happy Meals, and they have all this gear. And um, those two things just kind of came together in just a question like, oh, we should probably do that with a Happy Meal. And it wasn't a, like a ta-da kind of moment. It was more like, yeah, we probably could. And uh, the first prototype we did was just basically, we just went over, grabbed the Happy Meal, and just drew a kind of a, a viewer on it. And was like, yeah, that's probably, that, that's probably close enough. Uh, having no idea what it actually entailed building a VR headset, because we'd never really built one. Uh, and we pretty pretty early we realized that close enough with VR isn't really close enough. There there's no close enough. Uh, the 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 different focal length of, of the lenses makes a huge huge difference, and it's really hard to find that distance. Uh, it's a lot harder than you think, or at least that we think, because we bought a lot of uh, headsets and started dissecting them and realized that it was a lot to it. And Especially when you have an idea that involves kids in younger ages, and like we said before, there wasn't really a lot of um, examples of that. The the, the Google Expedition uh, program hasn't really launched yet, and we didn't really have any any references. Uh, but we knew that in the context we have it, with kids maybe being in the back seat of a car that and just had a burger, fries, and a milkshake, motion sickness might not be the most fun thing to encounter. So we wanted to really make sure that. The, the optics were, were really good. 
Um, so we started digging into the science and basically trying to learn as much as possible, uh, possible about the optics and how we could make, it, uh, make things work. And when I compared the, the Happy Goggles to the cardboard, one of the biggest differences is we did everything the wrong way. We did everything in reverse. The smart way to build a, a VR headset is, is to start with a phone and have a nice phone size and then find lenses that have a nice uh, distance to the phone size and then build the box in between. Um, that's the smart way to do it. We already had the box, so we already had the distance in between. So we had to build everything the other way around because we couldn't actually make more material, which meant all the materials we had for the box had to work with what we had, which is kind of a, can, it was kind of tricky. And uh, also we, we talked about early if we wanted to be able to flex the distance. So with the, with the cardboard, you always have this kind of flex with, uh, of distance. So if you have a iPhone 6, you, want, you might push it a bit further or, or, or back, depending on how thick your phone is. And it's not really a great solution for smaller kids because pretty much everyone who uses it uh, loses the phone. And we didn't, the same thing with the motion sickness in the car, we didn't want parents to uh, have to buy new iPhones every time the kids use the headset. So we knew that we were early on that we, we needed really to have a closed space. And if we had a closed space, we needed to be uh, a lot more focused on our lenses because we, we weren't going to be able to have that leeway. Um, and by this time, We've done a couple of prototypes, and we've shared uh, the idea with the client. And they, they liked the idea, and we got like a hesitant yes and something to work forward. And a lot of people were excited. Um, and we felt that we needed to move very fast with as little resources as possible. And both me and Sebastian are really um, fans of creating guidelines early, uh, both for the whole experience, but for the specifics as well. So these are this is a sample of the guidelines we, we did early, mostly could ju just to get the team on the same side, because everyone has a different idea of what the thing should be and who to aim for. And then you think you're all agreeing in the beginning, and then two months later, you realize you're not agreeing at all. Uh, and also, it helps you to really make decisions fast. So the ones we have for the whole experience is shareable, snackable, simple, and accessible. And then the sentence, the second sentence is how this applies to the box. So this should this apply to every touch point we had in this pro project, and Sebastian's going to get back to that as well. But for the box, it meant that it should be really easy to pass along to friends and family. So it shouldn't really be an immersive experience. It should be a shareable experience. Um, it, is, it should also work for kids and adults. So um, we really, we really needed to make a headset that that could bring families together and share an experience. Snackable meant. We wanted the content to be short and fun, and we didn't really want the experience to last more than around five minutes per session. This also goes back to um, there not being a lot of uh, examples of how this actually affected um, affected kids, for example. And we needed to, we had to do a later in the project. We did a lot of our own research uh, with this and and bought research, but we really wanted to sh stay on the short side. And simple, that's always a great rule, but um, we needed to, we wanted it to be really easy to fold and glue together because this headset comes pre-packed, which is great, but we couldn't really pre-pack our headsets because we knew the, the customer was gonna need to do some work themselves. And a lot of the DIY headset, uh, headsets at this time, you needed glue or, or um, um, cutters or whatever, and we knew that wasn't gonna cut it. And then accessible, it needed to handle most smartphones because uh, we wanted the whole experience is about accessibility and we really wanted anyone to be able to use it. Uh, but then when you work with McDonald's, there's some additional things you can control. So when you work with McDonald's, you have really strict safety guidelines when it comes to food. So everything uh, in the restaurant has to adhere to their guidelines, which means you can ha can't have any long uh, loose parts. You can't have any strong resins or glues. You you basically everything has to be tested. So, to put it simply, pretty much anything in McDonald's need to be edible. So it, theoretically, you should be able to eat our headset and not get sick, which isn't something I think applies to this. I'm not sure, but <laughs> it might. Which was. Um, it was a, a tricky one. And then the last one, which was the big one, is, is price. 
And we knew since we were going for scale and since scale was really important, we knew that this headset couldn't cost more than the plastic toys because we knew that none of the other countries would pick it up or it couldn't be a global thing. Because if you have a, if you sell a billion headsets and our solution is one kroner more expensive, that's a lot of money. Um, so what we had to aim for was $3 with food. So between half a dollar and a dollar. Um, which also makes things even more tricky. So we didn't really have a ton of room for fancy things. And I guess when we came here we were, to this point, we started to get a bit bummed out because we pretty much, we were like two or three people trying to build a headset uh, that never built a headset and our like paper prototyping skills were shit. And we didn't really knew, know what to do. And then we had all these other rules, but luckily we have Anna and, uh, Anna is our print production manager at McDonald's, um, at DDB for McDonald's, and she's just amazing. She does all the, the packaging and, and the print work for McDonald's. And <clears throat> yeah, she half of this presentation should be done by her, by her uh, building the box, because usually we'd have ideas how to solve things, and they'd be, <laughs> in hindsight, be pretty stupid. But so she would actually, she would actually, actually make it work. And this is a slide of, um, uh, the feedback, what it might look like. So we'd had versions of the box, and I have a bunch of uh, box versions here. We'd have versions of the box running, and then we'd have Google Docs just with photos and uh, sometimes pretty critical feedback, but uh, just running. And then we just photo things and highlight what we didn't like and put it in. So in this example, it was about making the uh, the, the paper cutouts a bit deeper and taking the rubber band as well, uh, taking that away um, because we felt that the rubber band added another, it was an add-on to keep the phone and, and we really needed to cut that cost off. Um, but also it, we felt like it messed with the function. But so Anna would just go through all these, um, the documents we had and then she'd come up with solutions together with us and we'll go back and forth and then we'd make another version and then we start making a tree out, uh, tree out of that. Um, and since we didn't really have a, a big budget in the beginning, we really had to do a bunch of uh, what we call ghetto user testing or ghetto everything. Um, and pretty much our first, our user testing was with us and we didn't have a budget to like, it, it's really hard to get kids in user testing as well. It's really hard to get like 50 kids to sit down or like you have to pay them and how does that work? And like, <laughs> it's super weird. It's basically child labor. Um, so we had to, of course, use uh, the kids of, of the, the people working at our office and just like go and ask who has kids and who, who can try them. And, but also since the whole experience also if, is for adults, we did a lot of testing as well. But then you have to do like really, I mean, let's be honest, you have to do a, a bunch of really bad things as well. Like, or not, not bad, but you don't have a choice. Like you just find people who have haven't tried VR and just give them a headset to see what they do and things like that, that just, to just see how people react. Because a lot of the people that were that we were aiming for with the, with the, with the goggles, they'd never seen VR. Like they would go into McDonald's and buy a Happy Meal, uh, you know, and then like, oh, what's this? Oh, it's VR. How do you explain that to someone who doesn't know what VR is? So we needed kind of um, that input as well. And a note on that, which which is which is good, is to and even if you do really scattered testing is to try and um, use the same questions and the same points. So even if you do that, try to keep the same kinds of questions and same things you're looking for, <clears throat> because that's a really important thing uh, to have everything organized, especially if you have a really unorganized process. Mm. So the four key things for us in this project uh, when it came to testing was we try to find ways to solve problems without adding, like we were talking about the, the rubber band. Because once again, at scale, if you add something, that's going to exponentially make things a lot harder uh, in the process uh, for the product. And as people, it's, it's really the easiest way, way to solve a problem. Usually what you fall back to is adding something. Just, just add that thing and it's going to solve itself. But we were looking, um, looking for things that solve the problem without adding. So a problem solved without adding is better than a problem solved with adding. And then we really had to do things bare bones. So we really 
subtracted everything until we started to lose core function. And that goes for the lenses, that goes for the button, everything just, we needed to go all the way down to where it wasn't even acceptable. And then the, that step above that, that was our MVP. And uh, explore more options. That's also like a really human lazy thing is that you'd find something that works and then you just keep working on that. Or you're like, oh, this is good, let's do that. But what happens usually is that the solution that might work now might not work later because you're not really sure what problem you're going to run into later. But if you have five options, you have a, a lot more pivot points later in the process. And also, since we knew we needed to limit things for, especially for the kids, the time in the box and things, we really wanted to create natural boundaries. Yeah, those are better than constructed. So you want to find natural ways of, of basically forcing people to, to act the way you want. Uh, and we didn't want to put in a bunch of software timers and things that felt like punishment. Because uh, also kids are super sensitive to that. Um, and now we're going to go into some of the solutions and, and, and the fi final viewer. Uh, yeah, so we ended up doing about, about 30 boxes. And I have uh, six or seven with, with me here, different versions you can look at later. They're all part, part of the, the second version of the box. So I couldn't find the really, really crappy, terrible first ones. Uh, actually, it's not that we didn't show them. We couldn't actually find them because we were moving the offices as well. And we dug through all the stuff, but we couldn't find them. Um, and that also proves the point. Like some, of th There's a huge difference in between them, and some of them are are slight differences so i was just uh, talking about before like we would have one one version that would be like 1.6 that would have a button version then 1.7 would have another um, solution for the button and then 1.8 would have the solution that was before so the 1.6 button and basically what happens is like oh this is not good and then oh this is worse and then okay so this is better like that's basically the process uh, and we're going to tr try to cram in some of the most uh, the best user insights in one slide, trying to keep this super simple as well, going back to the guidelines. And when it came to shareable, basically what we did, we tried testing everything and, and um, just taking away the strap for, uh, for the headset makes a huge difference. Because um, it's basically, when you have the strap, it's basically impossible to share it with someone. Because what we're, we were doing or aiming for was basically the reverse of what everyone else is aiming for. Because everyone's aiming for Im immersion. We were not aiming for immersion. We were aiming for shareability. So we wanted something that was fun and still you know, true to the VR experience, but wasn't this immersive thing where the kid just you know, went away into a different world. Um, so we, we took the strap away, and we also closed the sides uh, so you couldn't use headphones. Uh, because headphones is also a key thing for immersion. If you don't have the audio, uh, that's like half the experience. And also, um, when you take away the, um, the possibility to use the headphone jack, you can close the box completely and keep the, keep the phone a lot safer. Like we have our thing is just completely closed off. And also, when you don't have headphones, just watching uh, people use it, if you if you're actually hearing what's going on in the game, you feel more, you feel like you're participating, right? Because if you're sitting and someone has headphones on, you're not part of what they're doing. You're doing two diff different things. But if you hear what that person is listening to or what's happening, you still feel part of that experience, which is super, super important for us. And then Snackable was pretty much two birds in one stone. And it, it's one of the examples of uh, just super, super simplicity was uh, taking the strap away. Basically, what happened was when you tested with grown-ups, we could sit with the headset for like 10, 15 minutes, and that's not a problem. But when you saw, when we took the strap away and kids sat with it, after about three, four minutes, their arms tend to tire out. So what they would do was just, they would naturally pause. Um, and that's one of those things that if you don't pay attention, you usually miss because you're thinking like, that's too simple almost. But using that in comparison to what Sebastian's going to talk about, how you build up uh, timings in the software, you can make an, uh, an experience that feels natural because it wasn't, we could have put in a software timer in four minutes and said, like, da -da, you, you can't play anymore. But what happened was that after a couple of minutes when they tire, they would be like, oh, you can play. Um, and that's what we were going for. So that's uh, one of the simplest solutions I probably ever did because I didn't have to do anything. 
Um, and then simplicity, the, the button made it really complex for us. Um, and the, the, sep the safety rules, because we in the beginning we wanted to make a single headset out of, out of the box and have, uh, we had the first prototypes, we had like the, the lenses folded inside and it was a different construction. Uh, but for, for the safety reasons, we couldn't actually have the lenses separated. We needed to put those so that um, the kids couldn't put them, put them in their mouth. Uh, so we needed to do a separate inlay for that, which first bummed us out, but later it actually solved the problem we had with the button, because since we have such uh, the thin cardboard, uh, the, the box wasn't really stable. The button wasn't really stable. So the way we solved that was get the inlay in, and also uh, we did a really quick, a really dirty trick. It's like, if you look at the cardboard button, the whole thing here is a button. So when you rest your finger, you, you, you put some weight on it. But on our solution, actually the button is, this is not the bot button, this is the, the shell. So when you're pressing, you're pressing, but you're not resting your hand on it. I can show you that later, but, uh, and that made us, made the button function work. And then, Accessible, the only thing we could do was just obsessively test and try to find a good middle ground. And did, this had a lot to do with our lenses as well, because our lenses are, uh, they have a bigger sweet spot than the lenses in the cardboard. Um, so they work better in a, they work in a, in a broader distance, which it has its pros and cons, it, it, but it also needs to play in with the, with the software experience you, you have. So if you have really sharp graphics, Ours is almost as sharp as, as a, a decent headset, but if you have some of the, the lesser um, game experiences might not look as good because uh, we don't have uh, as strong of a, of a sweet spot. Um, and then uh, when we launched, we were, we were uh, really nervous <laughs> because we spent so much time on this. And like we said before, we, we were aiming for the Mashables and the Wired um, to pick this up. Uh, and we were just like sitting and refreshing our computer, looking at Twitter and doing all those things that you should never do when you launch anything, especially for McDonald's. That's usually a horrible experience. Um, you, you'd be surprised on how many people don't like McDonald's. <laughs> but uh, we, were super, we were super stoked about uh, the feedback we got. And we spent a lot of time uh, sending, sending boxes and that we didn't, that people actually like the headsets and they, they were easy to use. I mean, they still have a bunch of issues. There's still a bunch of things that like every time I see this, I just want to fix this thing that always goes up and I want to like those things. But all in all, uh, we were super, super stoked to get the, the kind of um, uh, feedback we got. And uh, that's pretty much my part. Thanks. <laughs> Nice. So let's talk about some tech process. So we have a console. It's done. It comes at a $3 cost with mad specs. has no memory, no GPUs. But we need to launch the console with a title. Well, technically, we really don't need it. But we wanted to have an experience that came with the box. So. Uh, that's the beautiful things about the experiences, is that they actually show us the potential that the consoles brings. The magic really lies within the content and not actually the, uh, the console itself. Because imagine yourself getting a Nintendo for Christmas without the Super Mario cartridge. It doesn't really have a purpose. So uh, the smart way here is, of course, to go into a creative session and uh, generate a bunch of ideas. But as Yuan mentioned out, we are not really smart per people. We start on the other way around. We start with the problems. And one of the main problems that we encounter, of course, is that McDonald's needs to be accessible on uh, all different types of mobile platforms. They need to be accessible for Apple users. They need to be accessible for Android users, uh, Windows phones, and even Blackberries. And that meant, if we were going to go for an experience, that meant that we were going to have four different code bases, at least. And that's not the thing that we really favor. We also needed to figure out a way to add tension to the experience. We needed to retain 60 FPS at all times, because if you drop below uh, 60 FPS, we get nauseous. And uh, we needed to figure out uh, 
more ways into like have a state saving if we were going to have a high score and stuff like that stay in budget and launch this at the end of uh, february 2016. and there's a lot of stuff to do uh, when you're a two or three man team so some other problems that we encounter in uh, mobile virtual reality is that you only have access to access to two axes it means that we can't really move in depth so we are going to have to build an experience where we're fixated in one spot. And as I mentioned earlier, we were going to launch this uh, at, uh, at the end of February 2016. And uh, we tend to like to do experiences that have some kind of cultural relevance. And luckily for us in Sweden, in February, we have something called Sportlovet. So we're kind of setting the frame here. We want some kind of winter experience. We know that the player is going to be fixated in one spot. So we needed to figure out how to add some more exciting to that. And luckily for us, Old School Game had already solved that. So this is uh, three screenshots from one of my favorite games of all time. We got the Outrun for the Amiga 500, got Stunt Car Racer in the middle for Commodore 64, and Mac Rider for Nintendo 8-bit. So now you kind of get a notion of how, how old we are, actually. <laughs> so. Super Bakken was born. We took a lot of inspiration from old games, as I said. We are going to build ourselves a ski experience. So uh, a good place to start is to, uh, to start in Google Docs. So we used Google Docs not, not only to do presentations, but we also use this as a game design tool. And uh, we know what kind of experience we have now. We need to start going uh, in reverse. We need to start exploring the user experience for a virtual reality. Since we know that the box is going to be closed off, uh, we know that the phone is going to be closed off in a box. We need to start to explore other types of interactions since we can really touch the touch the phone. So this is uh, cutouts from some of the user stories. Uh, we explored uh, an interaction where you had to nod to start the game, and it kind of makes sense. It feels quite natural. We also exper experimented with some kind of audio feedback, the same way when you start a um, uh, ski competition, you get the beeping sound. So we experimented with different kind of pitching. And we also wanted to add some more dimension to, to the experience since uh, we have the, the pitch that's looking up and down and the rotation. We wanted to add some tilting so you could take some more sharper turns in the experience. So now we know that what kind of experience we, we want to build, we need to test this. And one of the, we have a different types of models that we work from uh, in our team. And one of those uh, models is the rapid prototyping process. It's a compressed three-day sprint where we focus purely on the core functionality of things. So that means that we are going to go commando. We are not going to care about menus. We're not going to care about colors. Typefaces is not really relevant here. The core of this uh, exercise was to get something on the screen in virtual reality with device control at 60 FPS at all, at all times. So this is uh, one of my favorite uh, favorite parts of, uh, of projects. It's where I get to decide what colors we're going to use. I usually, uh, if we need uh, interactive elements, I usually go with full of pack red, blue, or green. And that drives the designers absolutely nuts. <laughs> And that's really funny. <laughs> so the lead word here is brute, for, brute force progress by any means necessary. And here things starts to get really interesting because how does two guys that have zero knowledge in building virtual reality experience go on and build one? We Google, of course. <laughs> this is uh, one of the first uh, search queries that we did. It was how to plus WebGL game on mobile browser. And the nice thing about Google, uh, Google search is that they do really good servings. So one of the first hits that we got was uh, actually a winter experience, which was really good for us, of course. Uh, it's an article uh, written by Felix Turner at Airtight Interactive, where he actually breaks down all the things that you need to know when building uh, mobile web experiences, uh, what you should think about, and all the caveats. So you shouldn't load two big worlds into the game because it's probably going to affect the, the FPS and the level of detail on how you render things on the screen. 
together with this article and the Google guidelines for virtual reality, those two things were going to be the foundation on how we continued and proceed to build our, uh, our game. But just downloading some guy's repo uh, isn't, really, isn't really valid. It doesn't answer to the core that we wanted to build. We wanted to add the stereoscopic rendering and device control. So we uh, stayed up late at night. We added the orbit control that came, uh, comes with the 3JS library. We added the stereo effect. We had a bunch of coffee. And since the 3GS uh, documentation isn't that really well maintained, we have to go on a scavenger hunt on Stack Overflow. And uh, Stack Overflow is really nice, but when you're on a state tight schedule, it's uh, not a place where you want to spend too much time. At. But we learned uh, a bunch of things. And the first thing that we learned was we can't really attach the orbit control to the device. We need to uh, handle what, uh, what's called the Euler angle rotation. It means that the rotation of, uh, of a body has uh, different rotation angles to the world. So pitching, meaning looking up and down, worked great, as long as you were uh, in a horizontal space. And looking left and right also worked great. But as soon as you started to pitch and rotate, the camera got completely thrown off. So it felt like you were scraping your face against the snow. So uh, we had to solve that. But it was good enough. So I'm just going to do some uh, a quick rant about the game mechanics in this uh, uh, at this stage because this isn't really tech solution; it's actually a game mechanics. But I think it's important to show the process that we, uh, uh, that we went through. And uh, of course, we continue to do the game mechanics in Google Docs because it's an awesome tool. We were we were thinking about how a real ski experience uh, uh, is like, and we were uh, supposed to escape down a slope. So we wanted to add some more attention to, the, to it. So we added two spawn spots uh, uh, next to the player uh, in the player's blind spot, because that's what can happen in, uh, in real life when you're skating down. If you're not uh, observant enough, somebody can come in and crash, uh, crash on you. Uh, so um, we added that. And then we added some uh, natural difficulty parameters, meaning that the longer you stayed on course, the faster the experience went. So we're mocking up the suspects. Uh, we went for low poly, mainly because we wanted it to, to be a cute experience, but also to keep rendering times uh, uh, down. And we wanted this experience to be as lightweight as possible. And I'm going to come back to why we wanted it to be uh, as lightweight uh, as possible. So we have an experience that runs on the browser. It kind of works on the mobile, but we need to test it in a nightly build. We need to test it in a native application. Because everybody knows that testing things on local host is absolutely not the same as running them in production. It works on my machine isn't really a valid argument because we wanted to target like tens of thousands of users from different platforms. First problem when, uh, uh, when loading in this, uh, this experience in a native application was the device pixel aspect ratio. The native applications forced the experience to go into a pixel aspect ratio of one, meaning that we didn't uh, control the retina resolution of that. And as you had mentioned, close enough in virtual reality isn't really close enough. And especially when you're going to have your phone like three inches in front of you in your face, you need the resolution to be as sharp as possible. So. In this, the experience in the native application didn't render well. But on the same device in the browser, it rendered as it should. At this point, we needed to start to look at uh, what kind of tool we were going to build the experience, because ripping some, uh, someone, off, uh, someone else's experience isn't really what we, uh, what we do in our team. So this is actually uh, where we met Robert for the first time. It was at the default launching party for their new engine from, from King. He presented himself that he was the VR guy here in Stockholm. So I thought to myself, yes, he's the man to talk to. And then we actually talked to each other and you learned that it wasn't pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you pointed us in the right direction. Uh, we looked at Play Canvas, which is which is an awesome uh, sandbox solution for building uh, uh, ver uh, WebGL graphics, and we also tested out the Unity because Unity had just released their 
cardboard SDK support and had also implemented the uh, export function for uh, for the web. And these tools are all great. They're all awesome. And that's a good thing about frameworks. It's that they allow us to keep development speed up, but they come at a cost. They can sometimes bloat the core. And this is not a thing that we wanted. We wanted something that was lightweight because we wanted to uh, utilize the app cache to uh, load the experience offline. And this was uh, before Service Worker existed. And uh, bloating a core can impact loading times and, uh, and the F occasional FPS loss. And sometimes when you're, when you're compiling, you get, you get bugs and you can really figure out why that is. So we went uh, with the 3JS library as bare bone as possible. So executing. Now we are looking at tools. Uh, we know what we want to build. We need to start to make decisions on how to cut corners and to keep, uh, as I said, development speeds up. So the smart way of executing is, of course, to avoid a world of pain. A native app is not just one native app. It's several native apps. And in McDonald's cases, it meant different platforms. And things will break. We are going to, we know by experience that we are going to encounter bugs. And if we're going for native, that means that we are going to have to push uh, to app stores or different kind of uh, release platforms, meaning that we have to take in consideration uh, revision timings, not a thing that we're really a fan of. So we went straight for, for the browser. And that's the nice thing about web, that you can do a hotfix on the fly, and it works cross platform for all the users. But we needed to convince the client because this we, we pitched that this ex experience uh, was supposed to live outside their ecosystem of apps, which, of course, uh, branding clients aren't really a fan of. But uh, we talked, uh, talked them through like the process of things and if we were going to have to do um, uh, an update that might take a couple of days, if the experience was broken for a user, it's a really hard thing to recuperate from. So they, they trusted us on this one uh, as soon as they saw the prototype that we, that we built. So we, we packed the game specs, we packed the tech specs, and shipped them to production. We're not really production-ready guys. We're more like creative technology, as we said. We write really shitty code, but we write, it, we write it really fast. So we need someone that's expert in that field. So we chose North Kingdom for that. But wait a minute. Going for the browser doesn't mean that you eliminate all the problems that you have when you're going on native. In uh, native applications, we have uh, access to, uh, to the idle state, me meaning that we can disable it. We can't really disable the idle state in, uh, in mobile browsers. So uh, how do we get around this problem? There are some hacks to this. It's uh, at that time we could fake a touch interaction or a scroll interaction and reset the canvas to the top immediately, meaning that it didn't really change anything for the user, but the phone was tricked into believing that it was a human interaction. And that's uh, not a really reli reliable solution because those, those things can get patched in, in the next version update. Because if we can simulate a touch interaction, that kind of means that we could potentially send a user to a website and with a shopping cart and check them out automatically, just in theory, nothing that you should actually do. So we needed to find a more reliable solution. And it's around this time, somewhere here, that you and Anna started to experimenting with adding a button to the experience. And uh, we're not going to take any credit uh, on uh, the creativity and implementation of uh, this, uh, uh, this exec execution in this certain problem. This was all done by North Kingdom that came back to us and said, yeah, uh, we can't really we, uh, we need to get a way, uh, have a way to get around the, the touch in interaction and the screen dim. So they added uh, frost to the goggles. So you need to wipe the, um, the goggles clean in order for the, uh, for the experience to continue. So we get to bypass the entire, uh, the entire problem with the screen dim, which is really nice. And it added a, a nice dimension uh, to the game. Tying back to some of the guidelines, simple. And we wanted the experience to be as simple as tilt to play. 
you can do user experience in a million types of ways. And what we wanted was to let the users start to explore at the right, um, uh, straight away. We took a lot of inspirations from uh, old game here as well. Uh, if you uh, remember the first Zelda, you start in a dark cave with a wooden sword, and that's it. You go out and explore. We wanted the same thing here as well. We wanted the user to rotate their phone and choose between virtual reality or magic window and then start to exploring, not to trigger a lot of tutorials or information screens and stuff like that. That's usually just in the way when you are when you are excited and want to try new, new stuff out. Guidelines, same rules applies for the technical solutions as for the box. Shareable, no leaderboards. We took this decision kind of late. We, of course, uh, or me personally, love high scores. But as soon as you remove high scores, you're not chasing anything, meaning that you're more likely to, to put down the experience once you are content. Simple, tilt to play. And accessible, one URL to rule them all, meaning that with one URL, we could target multiple platforms and just utilize in one code base. Snackable. And this is where the natural um, difficulty parameters, as I said earlier, comes into play. The, fa the longer you're in the experience, the faster the experience goes. So the average time per run in, uh, in this experience was around three minutes based on the Google Analytics, which was uh, right in between where we wanted it to be. We didn't want the experience to last more than five minutes. So we're reaching the, the, the final part of the presentation. So I just want to share some of the, our process uh, with you as well. This was our plan. It's a really nice and tight plan. It's got four steps to it. It's the research, where, you, where we do the groundwork. It's the prototype, where we do the testing. It's the test and iterate. And, the, and if the iterations passes the test, we get some sales of products. It's really simple. But this is the actual reality. We started with the prototype and the research at the same time. We got all excited, it felt really good, and enter a, a period of despair, like straight away, like that. Because as soon as we started to dig into this experience, we encountered a lot of pr problems and a lot of trouble down the, down the road. And when we thought that we had figured out those problems, we felt like we were gods. And then we entered despair like a split second later because we got the box back and we, it had a different paper thickness. And just with a half millimeter paper thickness, that threw the kind of the optics off. And then uh, when we chose the web, we got the auto lock and idle, t idle screen. So it was a lot of, uh, a lot of problems to, to solve. But we had invested a heavy amount of time in this, so we just said, fuck it, let's just do this. So we worked around the clock for the last couple of weeks just to make it, uh, to make the project come through. And around the, the prototype, prototype, the ninth prototype about this project, we thought, that, OK, this is good enough. Of course, it wasn't. We ended up with 30 boxes. So if you find yourself stuck in this kind of process, or uh, yeah, I can really recommend this book, Getting, uh, Getting Real from uh, 37 Signals, the guys that made the Basecamp, Ruben Rails framework, to name a few. It's a really nice book where the essence of the book is that you should uh, just focus on the things that really matters, what makes a difference and what doesn't make a difference. As I mentioned earlier, we don't care about colors or typefaces when we're in the rapid prototype process because it doesn't really add value. So it's uh, around 200 pages. Uh, read it if you haven't. It's, it's what has guided us through a lot of projects. So pressure testing. I got this model from, uh, uh, from my social feed a couple of weeks ago. And I didn't really understand it first, but then I kind of looked at it more closely. And it kind of reflects like everything that we do in our team, and especially this, this project. 
we try to test out the core if the core holds up or if it doesn't. If it doesn't hold up, we sack the project. I mean, we have sacked countless of projects because uh, in the initial ideas, it kind of makes sense and it kind of feels cool. But as soon as you start to try it out, it actually doesn't hold up. So we need to either burn the project or pivot. And if the core is so strong that we really believe in it, we build from that point. We don't start at the beginning the same way we didn't start this presentation with slide one. We started somewhere in the middle. And in this project, for us, the core was the box. Thank you. So I thought we'll do a few questions. Hopefully you'll have questions uh, or praise or something. Uh, since we're recording this, it would be nice to just pass the microphones around. We have two microphones. Anyone? No question. Nice. Absolutely clear. Yeah. The uh, list of uh, snackable and so on. Uh, have you guys ever looked at the uh, Double Fine Happy Action Theater? No, because no. it kind of matches exactly. It's All right. a small Kinect game called Kinect Party these days for Xbox 360. Yeah. And it fits in perfectly with everything. Oh, nice. You actually just turn it on and the kids can start it themselves. It's short games that change themselves. You don't count high score. You just wave and then you continue and it just goes on. It fits like a beep glove. It's, nice. It's perfect. So take a look at that. That's Connect yeah, party. Well, connect party. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Cool. No questions? Let's go for some bears then. <laughs> yeah. Maybe robots have some questions. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> you have any questions, robot? Yeah, I mean, you can find us uh, out there, I guess, drinking bears. Just come up and talk to us. I mean, we're really keen on like meeting new peoples and sharing ideas and stuff like that. So, yeah. sorry. And uh, thanks for coming. Hope you don't. Thank yeah. you. Wait, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, how does the button work? Ah. Oh, ah. Yes. Oh, right. uh, how does the buttons work? Yes. You, you transfer the touch to the screen. I mean, how do you do that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it 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 works the same way uh, the second version cardboard does. Kind of. It's a it's a built-in mechanism that leads conductivity from your finger to the screen. Um, and uh, the cardboard uses this nice uh, conductive foam, which was way too expensive for us. So actually, we use uh, we did a bunch of versions. We used conductive ink. I, I this actually, is uh, conductive ink painted <laughs> on the cardboard. I actually, First brought, test. I actually brought the final solution we use. We use uh, foil tape for our version, actually, uh, which works great. <laughs> um, so instead of using the foam, it's just a strip of foil over a paper cut. Okay. Uh, oh. Or does it taste? Yeah. <laughs> is it edible? Theoretically, uh, but um, we haven't tried it. We have we haven't tested it. User testing. But but uh, I'm not sure it's it's uh, great at eating. But you probably won't die. I'm not sure if you have uh, questions about specifics. Uh, Amna is the one who actually had to do all these uh, weird things. We're, but that that's also the example we had with the boxes. The 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 example I was talking about was actually a version. Uh, uh, you can see the sequence here. Um, so this is sequences. This is version 1.5, and this this button uses the uses conductive foam. And this is version 1.6, and then you see the foil, which worked terribly. It didn't work at all. We thought, and then uh, we went to 1.7, which is conductive ink, which worked great. Was super expensive, so that was out of the question. And then we went back to foil actually, and. Uh, what happened there was that the first time we used the foil, we cut the foil. So we used two parts of foil. And then the second part, Anna pretty much said, well, you won't get any more money than the foil. So we have to make it work with the foil. So I spent an even, evening just trying to figure out how to do that. And when you actually patch the foil in one piece like this and you don't cut it, the condu conductivity is way better. So instead of doing two patches. So that's why this is... This, I mean, I put that here. So, like, this is 
That's literally that. So it's literally a, a patch of aluminum. And this this solution came also came from kind of a, we do a bunch, we do a lot of uh, workshops with clients and we do a lot of, if anyone's used the makey makey things that are super fun. And then you, you use conductive ink, you do bananas and you use foil. And uh, basically we were just sitting trying to figure this out. It was like, you should probably be able to use foil, right? And so that worked pretty well. And it's very cheap. Where was it actually manufactured in the end? Um, the lenses are from China. The... Which is a story in itself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It was a lot of uh, Alibaba and AliExpress time <laughs> for us. Remember uh, this? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we ordered a, a big pack of uh, lenses with a specific type of specs. When we got them, it was the wrong specs. <laughs> So we have to go back. Well, we and got read samples it. first. Yeah, we, we got, got samples that were great. Yeah. So we built the box around the samples, and then when we got the lenses, it wasn't the same. <laughs> yeah, that's so what we happens. have to go back to the drawing table and redo the box. Yeah, because we couldn't get the new. It did. It, it wouldn't matter how wrong the Chinese were, because we wouldn't be able to get three thousand new lenses yeah. in like two weeks. And we ordered them exactly at the Chinese New Year, yeah. which is like three weeks of total blackout. Uh, but yeah, the, the the rest of the McDonald's actually has their own. They have a printing company that's in in Stockholm that does all the the major printing things. Uh, and then basically the, the these uh, inlays are put together uh, in I think in Örebro or something. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's uh, like fifty or sixty ladies working there part time just folding these. Um, because the way it looks in the in the final product is basically you get the lens kit inside, like we said, for safety reasons, and then uh, you unfold the box. So the whole box is is the shell. So you pop out the eyes uh, and the nose, and then you fold fold it. Uh, we wanted to bring some boxes for you to get, but we actually we didn't we didn't have any boxes left, so we couldn't have any. And if you want to check them out, we have a bunch of prototypes here. Sure. So it sounds like you were quite close to the deadline when you finalized the hardware spec. How close? For the box or for the game? <laughs> for the box. Uh, I don't even know how many times we finalized the box. Uh, I think 30 uh, times. Yeah, I think at least four times we finalized the box. I think. I did. We we did the final production version because the thing is, what we had to do as well was we needed to change the thickness of the paper, uh, because the thickness we had in the cardboard uh, didn't go through, or the the way it was made didn't go through the the safety. Um, so we had we needed to use a thicker kind of denser paper that just screwed the optics. So the way we solved that, which is also a, a super ghetto solution uh, is um, so you see how this is folded here in the back so it's two layers mm -hmm. that's the solution uh, so it, with a thicker paper we had one fold and then when the paper got thinner we needed to do a second fold uh, so yeah <laughs> with a lot of those types but of the solutions. question actually was how close to the deadline were we oh. I don't even remember mm, a couple of days <laughs> um, I think they weren't folded, so I think when we got the last production version of the paper, it was probably a week before shipping or something like that. Because yeah. we had to, we had to express send three thousand boxes from to Urubu and from Urubu in like three days. Yeah, I think. Um, as we just said, you were quite close to the deadline. How much testing did you do? How satisfied were you with the testing? And then when it was out there. How happy were you with the feedback? Not that we saw a lot of um, news, but the feedback you personally got. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the best feedbacks we got uh, uh, was a post actually from uh, on Twitter, a uh, 14-year-old uh, guy named Alfred, uh, who has in his bio that he's a jailbreak hacker. He got a pack, uh, a pair of uh, 
a pair of goggles where he started to, of course, he didn't run the experience that we shipped it with. He ran his own experience on that. So I think that was kind of the best feedback, I think, personally, uh, that we got because that was kind of the point to release the boxes and let, uh, let uh, the others actually build their own experiences. Uh, regarding how happy we were with the boxes, I think, I mean, I, I was really happy that people liked it, but uh, like I said, uh, I mean, there are so many things with the boxes that you just, when you see it, you want to correct it. And I think that's, uh, that's just, you know, how, how we are <laughs> like that. I, I don't think we've ever, I've ever released a project where I'm like, oh, this is the best. There's nothing wrong with this. Like, you know, the inside of it, you know, all the dirty secrets of the project and you know, everything that's wrong and you're just hoping that someone won't, someone else won't find that. I think, to be honest. So what's next? Uh, uh, hopefully that's confidential. <laughs> no, hopefully uh, a version two. Um, will be coming up. We're not sure yet. We're, we're actually, we're uh, in the in the process with uh, McDonald's of seeing everything goes, uh, when you're doing things with like global, it go, it takes a long time. So I think we're probably gonna need to uh, have a couple of more runs to convince them because it's a big, it's a really big investment for them. And um, we, for them to be able to change their whole production process of all the, the boxes, because they're all made in different parts of the world and everything is, it's a massive investment for them. So they're really hesitant, but hopefully um, we've actually started building or prototyping new. We uh, have a working prototype, but that's. Uh, or a new, on a new in experience, but not a new box actually. Mm -hmm. You mentioned during the testing, you just asked uh, some adults to help you. So I want to know, before you release this product, did you really, really ask some kids to you yeah. involve? Yes. How many? Uh, we, yeah. we did, uh, that was, we were, that part is about the initial testing, like the yeah. first testing we did before we had the budgets. And then when North Kingdom started producing the game, we've gotten a big, bigger budget to, to do the game and they did continuous user testing. And then we had McDonald's actually hired a uh, bunch of child psychologists and some other things, and they started doing their own testing as well when we had the actual box. But developing the box, we didn't really have access to that. But when we had like a version of the box that could be tested and we and the project gotten forward, we actually did proper, not ghetto user testing. Um, I'm just a little bit curious. Okay, mm -hmm. feedbacks between, you know, adults and the kids. Yeah. Yeah, so any differences? Yeah, I think, I mean, the first thing is the uh, adults are a bit more specific. Like yeah. you, a kid won't go like, oh, this is a really nice experience. I think the hole should be a bit bigger. They're more like, oh, I don't like this. Like that's the feedback you're going to get often. Oh. And so it's more about like observing or trying to observe what they do more than, because they're not going to tell you. And that's a really hard thing. And that, I, that's a hard thing with adults as well, because usually you think you know but you don't know. So you learn more from observing people than listening to people. And I think that's a, one of the mistakes a lot of people do is that they don't watch people. They actually yeah. they do a survey or they listen to what people say and people uh, spend more, you know, spend more energy um, trying to act the way you, they think you want them to act mm -hmm. uh, than actually being honest. So usually one hour of just observing someone is better than, you know, 50 questionnaires the problem is like getting an hour with observing someone is super that's a super weird situation it's not a really easy way to go into like can i watch you use this for an hour it's yeah. it's a lot weirder to do i agree <laughs> yeah. i worked with the kids yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, kids even worse that's yeah <laughs> thank you <laughs>